Welcome to Baseball Biz. I'm Mark Carvich, your host, and with me today, of course, is that supreme analyst with all things Rays baseball, and that is Mr. Matt Germain. How you doing today, Matt? I'm doing outstanding. How about you? Man, I'm having a wonderful day. Well, I'll tell you what, it's been kind of a not so wonderful day. I had great expectations. I mean, I, I'm I'm looking at the Rays and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, look, we've got a team in the 800s winning category. This this is stupefying. It, it's amazing. And then there's New York. <laughs> well, it, to be quite honest, it's not as bad as it seems on paper. I think they're all the games were fairly close with the ones that they lost anyway. So when you're losing games by one run, the margins aren't really terrible. So they, it's just that the odds didn't fall in your favor and you've got to clean up a couple of things. So I'm, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about that. <laughs> yeah, man, I, I'm, I'm, my run differential thing is getting hurt. What can I say? But <laughs> seriously, it has been amazing to watch these young men. And offensively, there's doing some great things. I think you and I both will talk a little bit about where we see some room for improvement and what Kevin has to work with. I mean, we started out with this. I had hoped, if not to sweep, at least to take the series against the Yankees. And we wound up splitting it. But we yeah. got to see some really great talent playing out there in all of those games. I think it was the first time this year where it felt like a playoff atmosphere. Like both teams were engaged. The The hype was up. Before that, the Rays were coasting a little bit of on cruise control. So I thought that was the first series where they got tested. And then maybe it's a little bit of lag after that in, in the Mets series, but I felt like that had some carryover where there some of the issues that propped up during the Yankees uh, series, especially the pen, became an even bigger problem during the Mets one because it continued, basically. There's one guy, I'm just going to say his name right now, Jason Adam. Oh my gosh. That poor lad, man. He thought he had lost the game the other night when uh mm -hmm. judge had hit, hit that one ball during the Yankee series and Siri got all the way back out there and caught it. Adam had already given up he, his body. He had just collapsed over himself and he just had so much difficulty last night, last night being of course, Wednesday, it's Thursday evening right now while we're talking, but there's that young man. I just don't know. I don't know if he's just having a difficult time or we need some strength, man. We we got, I'm I'm going down the list a bit. Let's come back. We'll start with the Yankees because I can go on and on about what's happened the last few days, brother. Okay. Going yeah. to the Yankees, going there. And at a time when a radio station in New York saying the Rays are cheating. <laughs> I love those folks. Uh, somebody has, they think they're John boy. They're not going to get there, but the Rays went to New York, and there's been a little bit of a rivalry back and forth. You know, what? it's so much so that after Rosarina had hit a home run earlier, that he got beamed the next inning. Well, we talked about this before, though, didn't we? Yeah, I, I think part of the reason it becomes a bigger deal with the Rays and the Yankees is it goes all the way back to CC Sabathia days. Oh. And even before that, like, there was always blame game going around. And I think... The Yankees that's like did it on purpose almost just to be antagonistic. That they wanted to they wanted the Rays to not be thinking about baseball and to be thinking about other things instead, which sort of it was effective in that way. So right now, what's interesting is you can watch Kevin Cash be cool as a cucumber the entire year. He goes up against Aaron Boone and his blood pressure boils. And that says a lot about the person, right? There's something about that. And Aaron Boone is the one making those calls. Like, I firmly believe that. He's the one saying, this is a time we got to respond, boys. And I'm telling you, it, it's not the way we should be playing the game anymore. It, it really isn't. There's no need for it. We need to allow those players like Randy Arena to be themselves, to be flamboyant, to be marketing tools for the game in a positive light. And anytime we start plucking them the way that Aaron Boone ordered, it's not a productive and positive thing for the game of baseball at all. It's like bringing back the times when managers used to kick sand on the umpires and that kind of thing. There, there came a time when that had to go in the same way that sim things that had to go with hockey. And, and it's just time. It's time to turn that page. Yeah. You know, I wonder if the ghost of Billy Martin lives inside of Aaron Boone. 
for all mm-hmm. that uh, anxious nature that he seems to have out there. I uh, saw so what was it the other night with the Blue Jays. You know, they're there's a they're right in the middle of a, um, a series going on, and <laughs> wouldn't you know it, uh, Aaron Boone gets kicked out the other day. He takes his gum and he takes it out and he tosses it across the field. And I'm thinking, man, oh man, that just stands up as a person of great character. <laughs> oh, God, it's, but there's a lot of the non-character things going on with the Yankees in general. Oh. For a clean cut team, they sure aren't clean. That's for sure. Oh no, they they've got they've got a little ugliness. But I I do have to respect some of the talent out there, and mm-hmm. names I hadn't really thought about before was it Harrison Bader, Harrison Bader with the Yankees. He was just performing fantastic out there in the outfield, and he was you know bringing a bit in with the the offense as well for that team. Right. Harrison Bader is bringing a little bit of the, the Cardinal way to the Yankees, which they desperately need, to be quite honest. And in a little bit of the same way that Rizzo brought some class and and kind of, uh, uh, you know, somebody that you respect and on that team as well. I think both those guys are guys that will show up every day, play hard. Although Rizzo's D has taken a hit this year. I don't know what's going on, if it's a mental lapse uh, or if he's just relaxing too much out there and thinking he has the play made. But uh, but at the plate, he's, he's doing his thing. And I think Bader fits right in with him. So between the two of them, they have a good supporting cast around uh, Judge. Uh, the Gliber Torres, though, is the one guy on that team where I think uh, epitome of a lazy all-star that just for some reason can't get plays made uh, whenever he's on the field. And he always seems to have little hot stretches here and there at the plate. But he always seems to tail off after a while as well. I think the Yankees might see that now where they're like, we have to target the right players to have the right character because they've been bitten so many times before with guys that may not have pulled their own. Well, you know, like Brett Gardner, it was, I think the last couple of years he was there, he was not pulling his own. He, not that he was a slacker, but he just wasn't able to bring it to, the game to it. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. but, and, and you t- there's some talk about the, kind of a negative energy from the Yankees and certainly Brett Gardner, <laughs> he had his in it as much as he would beat up the entire dugout to death. I mean, that's not the sort of behavior you really want to show your kids. Right. So let's see what else here, my friend. There's some sadness this week too. I mean, looking at pitching, looking at Drew, man, Drew Rasmussen, seeing what a great talent, you know, playing fantastic. And then suddenly, He's not with us. He's a man with two Tommy John surgeries. Is feeling what I think some stress in uh, his arm around his yeah. elbow. And if you hear anything around the arm or elbow with a pitcher, you're thinking, oh, my gosh, Tommy John's. So he's going to be out for a while. I don't know if they've actually determined anything on Drew or not, but he is a pivotal part of that five-man rotation that the Rays want to have a strong rotation. What they've said is that there's no expectation that he'll require Tommy John. And that there's nothing structural that's kind of uh, needing to be repaired. So it, it's more of a rest program. And I don't, he might get an injection. He may not. I have no idea. But my idea is, is for 2023, when he returns, he should be going to the pen where he's needed, where he has experience. And he should be doing, you know, two innings, maybe three innings, sometimes outings where he can actually nail down a lot of these wins that the Rays are letting slip through their fingers against some of the better teams. And in a playoff scenario, I'm just trying to picture, you know, seven innings of Shane McClanahan and then two of Drew Rasmussen. It sounds like an <laughs> ideal playoff scenario to me. So with Drew gone, but like I said, bring him back on a limited sense. Cause that's what I worry about with those arms. You know, we've mm-hmm. got this great talent, but how much, how much should we use them? I mean, at what point do you, you bring them back? Say, okay, I'm going to, I want to keep that arm safe. I'm mm-hmm. asking these young men to throw faster than they've ever thrown in, you know, at least from two or three decades ago. And I'm asking them to do it consistently. Uh, and oh, by the way, you, you can't have any pantar or anything to keep your stickiness on your hand because, you know, looking back, that was part of the problem. Some people thought when, when Tyler went out with, you know, and having to have Tommy John, that his problem became when he could no longer use any kind of sticky substance. Right. And I think 
you know, the pressure that these players are feeling because they're, number one, they're measured against the greats, right? They're measured against the guys, how many complete games they had, how many innings they threw in a year, how many. And so they're always measured with that yardstick, essentially. So in their minds, they still have to accomplish the same performance in terms of length and innings as in the past. And they've got to increase the velocity by five to 10 miles an hour. That's just not physically doable. So in my train of thought is, yes, you can, there are certain workhorses. There are guys like, let's say, Jared Cole or some of the guys that are that hold up well. You don't see any indications that anything is wrong. If you want to ride them out at a certain rate, that makes sense. For the majority of guys, and I mean the majority, you have to go to a six-man rotation, and you have to, or you have to seriously limit the innings. Now, in the race case, they tried that limit of innings with Drew Rasmussen. In their credit, he barely ever went over five innings. Even last year, no matter how efficient he was, it was five innings, you're out. So the Rays did a really good job, I thought, of mitigating the risk. Now, despite that, he still had issues. But you got to remember, two Tommy Johns right back to back when he was young, it, that has a serious impact on that arm. And that's why I believe his future is in the pen. You've tested the limits now as a starter. You know that wasn't beneficial to his uh, overall outcomes. So now you're going to have to use him as a high leverage guy, and you're going to have to pick and choose when you use him. And that's why I said it's two or three innings for him and as a relief. Because if you use him as a closer, and you're going to want to use him on back-to-back, -back, sometimes back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back days, that's not ideal either. You want to be able to have him go, you know, I don't know, let's say 40 pitches max in, in his outings where he's done and then he gets a day or two off afterwards at a minimum, you know. And, and so I think the Rays with the way that their pen is set up, they can accommodate that and still have a very effective pen. There's guys right now getting four or five days rest that Cash refuses to use <laughs> and he keeps going back to the same guy. So, I mean, what's the difference? You know what I mean? Like. It, I don't know. I think Kevin Cash has been dealt a very raw hand with the the pen and and something's got to give because the Rays are playing a thin line here with with the way that they're rotating guys in and out of that pen at a certain rate and first of all it looks bad. Yes, I get that it's giving people an opportunity, but it's it's like you're churning the meat grinder of of bringing guys Yes, you're part of a team. Okay, you're gone. Okay, yes, you're part of a team. Okay, yes, you're gone. Okay, you're, and it, it, it's sort of this, it's becoming a, a little bit ridiculous. And I get what they're doing and what they're trying to do, but it's too much. It's just, I don't know. I'm going off on the sideline here. No, no you're, you're, Drew, Drew could help that. Well, see, and the thing of it is, the pin is not as strong as we'd like. I mean, Kelly and Kelly, little, um, she's, you know, what we were getting the other day, Poche, he's looking fairly good, but a consistency and doing the taxi service of bringing players up and back and forth between Durham and here, I don't think that serves anybody. And quite honestly, today, you know, being Thursday, watching the Rays play the Mets and seeing Taj Bradley out there. And I'm thinking, is he really ready? I guess if he's going to bring him up, playing the Mets is as good as any for him to get out there. And he had a rough first inning Kyle Snyder the hitting coach went out there and spoke with Taj Bradley who's pitching and you know he must have had a conversation because things did get better my question comes to you Matt on this is is there there's not really you're, it's all about winning at this point I, I'm should be I guess the training should all be done long before they come up you know to play in, in the show and I feel like we're still training some people after they get to the race. But that's the race. That's always been the race that will always be the Shane McClanahan made his first outing in the playoffs. Like there's very few organizations that, and I think the race, especially in the last two years have decided to say talent trumps experience. They're going with that model. And I think it's the right model. And that's why I'm pushing for guys like Jacob Lopez to be in the pen instead of rotating all these, you know, oh, maybe they can eke out a living in the in the back end of the pen, guys. Like I would rather have like Jacob Lopez has a almost 15k per nine right now in double A. 
and he's dominating. He's just back from injury this year. So I get the, you know, wanting to build him up over time. I, I, I understand it, but he's the type of guy that I would rather them use. That's an internal piece that they know thoroughly that they'll use consistently. And it sets this, this kind of routine in the pen right now. You've got maybe four or five steady guys in the pen and everybody else is just churning all the way through like three guys all the time. Somebody new over and over again. And that wears on the on the camaraderie and the dependency between one another in the pen. And it also wears on how Kevin Cash has confidence in these guys. How is Kevin Cash supposed to have any confidence in bringing these guys in, in in key situations? Managers are very finicky when it comes to pen use, even Kevin Cash. And, and if he has to leave Ryan Thompson in there over 25 pitches and he's facing Aaron Judge and he gives up a home run, you cannot blame Ryan Thompson. At that point, it becomes the raised front office that failed Kevin Cash and didn't give him the better alternative to put into that situation so that Ryan Thompson doesn't have to throw two innings against the Yankees. To me, that's the that's the problem. And when you have a guy that's fighting his touch and feel like Jason Adam is, and I know it's there, he'll figure it out at some point. Right now, it looks like he's throwing batting practice. It looks really bad. Yeah. And it's because his pitches are floating a little bit. They're not biting the way that he's used to. And he's trying to get that last touch and feel to click and it will. But when it doesn't, when you're a guy with his kind of profile, it looks really bad and it makes him look like he's never going to get there, but he will. I think, I don't think it's injury related in his case. And he knows that like, and he's fighting through it. It's just when you have that as being your best high leverage performer right now because of the issues that pete's having i i still think there's a chance that pete might be injured i don't know he's chugging it out there but there's something different and they whether it's cold related i don't know but it certainly doesn't give you confidence for the playoffs <laughs> you know no, no, if the no. guy can't pitch in the cold he can't pitch in october yeah, well, really. I mean, and last night was indicative of that. I mean, anybody watching the game, you see him out there, he had his turtleneck on, and after each piss, you see him put his hand back into his rear pocket. I don't know if he had a heater back in there or something to keep it warm, but the man's mm-hmm. – it's not an injury, but what he's facing, what he's challenged with is, I think, the blood cells or capillaries being able to move quickly in the hand and uh, getting right. the circulation he was looking for. And in cold weather – that ain't going to happen. You know, I mean, it's not going to be as well. He, it's not the best conditions for him to be, to give his best per- performance. Last night, he referred to himself as the lesser Pete, <laughs> yeah. meaning, meaning that Alonso was the greater Pete because of him hit, getting that ball off of him, hitting the it ball off It does bring him. up a good question, though, because now you, you start facing the question of how important is home field advantage to the Rays? It's extremely important because then they'll know they'll be in the dome for the majority of games in any series. And to me, that means that Pete would have all the feeling of of his hands and fingers, right? During those starts. So that has to be a priority for the Rays. They've got to do whatever they need to do to make sure that they win the division and that they have home field advantage through the playoffs. This week didn't make anybody feel a whole lot more comfortable. I mean, outside of the fantastic start we had, but you've said it, I've said it. <laughs> there's going to be a time where we're not knocking it out of the park every time. Like, however, there's okay. were a lot of home runs this week, but you're not going to necessarily win every game. And and this week was kind of a, a case study in that. Yeah, most definitely. But there's going to be stretches like that, right? First of all, the pen that we're seeing right now is going to have two big pieces added to it between now and I think mid-August. So when when Sean Armstrong is supposed to come back at the beginning of June, uh, that's a big piece that I know Kevin Cash will trust and use in the right spots. And then Andrew Kittredge is another one in August that's supposed to return. Now, I've said this over and over again to people on Twitter and anywhere else when I talk to them about baseball. There's no assurances that a reliever coming back from injury will be as effective as he was before he had that injury, right? There's always a, a, a time when they're trying to get back into the swing of things. It's very rare that you'll get a guy that that just clicks right away. Um, so I still think the Rays will look for at least one piece to add on the market at the trade deadline or before if they can 
Um, I don't know. It seems to me like the Rays on the trade market are, are aiming for elite, right? They're, they don't want to sit and be mediocre. They want to get the best guys. So you're talking Alexis Diaz, you're talking, and I think, you know, someone like Greg Jones would be a big interest to the Reds. Uh, he's playing center field right now in Durham and he would be elite in their center field in, for the Reds. Uh, they have a really strong core of of young infielders. So if they could add something with his range in center field, I think it would help their whole team out a lot and all their pitchers. So him and two other pieces might get it done. It's a reliever. The Reds shouldn't really care about a reliever. They're not aiming to win it all this year. Uh, I know it's hard and you're always saying, well, they have six years of control and Alexis Diaz. Alexis Diaz could have three bad years like his brother did, you know, and then find it back again. You don't know how it'll all shake out over those, those six years. So the Rays are still taking a risk by taking on a reliever for a lot of talent. So, but I do think that's the, the level of guy that they need to be aiming for because if they go into the playoffs with something similar to what they have now, even if they did add Drew Rasmussen, they would still be thought walking a thin line that doesn't give them much assurance to be quite honest it's good it might even be very good by the end of the year but it's not elite and I've, we've seen it with the braves with the dodgers who go out and they have four high leverage relievers when they walk into the playoffs and there's a reason for that right you got to be able to chug them out night after night because you're always in high pressure in the playoffs so that's the aim really to get four to five guys you're very 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 comfortable with in playoff situations. Well, let me ask you, being the Rays fan that you are and analyzing the game as well as you do as far as pitching, we've talked about Jeffrey Springs being out. We've talked about Tyler being out, Drew being out. What what does that five-man rotation or six-man rotation look like now? What is that? To me, as soon as Tyler Glass now comes back, it's Shane McClanahan one, Tyler Glass now two, uh, Zach uh, Eflin three, and then you have Josh Fleming opener style, whether he starts or opens, I don't know. And then you have Taj Bradley. To me, that's a very strong five. And you've got Yanni Chirinos still refining his stuff down in AAA. He can pop up once in a while. Maybe if Josh Fleming ends up being hurt for a little bit, he can take Josh Fleming's place. Whatever it may be, they have some wiggle room there. I think the key, once they do that, once Tyler Glasnow comes back and once Taj Bradley is firmly in a rotation, they need to promote some of the double-A talent to triple-A to prepare them to be the next wave. So guys like Sean Hunley and Jacob Lopez should be right up to triple-A. Maybe Mason Montgomery along with them. I don't know how satisfied they are with his performance. It's a little bit kind of eh, not as strong as last year, so maybe they give him a little bit more time. Uh, Cole Wilcox has had a few hiccups along the way as well but you're talking four really strong double a guys that need to have that triple a experience to refine what they've done so far this year because they'll have guys behind them as well you have Keyshawn askew you have guys like logan War workman that are going to come back from injury you also have uh ian seymour um there's a whole bunch of guys that'll be back eventually that they need to make room for i think you need to know what you have in those four so in wilcox Montgomery, Lopez, and Hunley. You have to know what you have in those four so that you can make rule five decisions by the end of the year. And then so it's going to be interesting. And you're also marketing them at that point for a potential trade deadline, right? So if the Rays do want to include one of those guys to go get an elite reliever, then that makes them even more attractive to other teams, assuming they, they do well. You've in the past, you've talked about the strength of the farm system and there still needs to be a little bit more nurturing for them. So we'll see. And I, I hope that comes to be, I'd love to see those guys move up and I'd love to see you have a solid team with McClanahan with Tyler, Zach, you know, Josh, uh, Taj and, and Yanni. And the, to me, yeah, that, I'd love to see them solid and know that they're going to be healthy and be there. But like you're saying, we gotta, we gotta be bringing those people up for the strength now, today on Twitter, Matt, I noticed there was some conjecture anyway about potentially some other people coming on to the Tampa Bay Rays roster. And you can find Matt at on Twitter at Matt, M-A-T underscore Germain, G-E-R-M-A-I-N underscore. And tell us a little bit about the discussion on potential new Rays. Uh, which ones in particular are you talking about? How about Pete Alonso? 
<laughs> the Pete Alonso one. Yeah. So I I kind of threw this out. I don't know. I think it was two years ago because I there was a whole thing about looking at the trend that the Rays were bringing in a lot of Tampa natives and a lot of Florida natives, and they seemed to be focused on that front. So I started talking about how Pete Alonso would be a great ad at that point. But obviously, everybody knew there was no way that was ever going to happen. Fast forward to now, and in between having Freddie Freeman offered $140 million for seven years by the Rays so that he could anchor their lineup, and then knowing that they're more concentrated now on hitters with power in their lineup than ever before, and then having that Pete Alonso come to Tampa last year and kind of talk about how warmly, you know, he sees the area, spends his winters down here, yada, 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 and he'd lo- he was just... Uh, elated to be playing at the trot because he'd won a whole bunch of baseball there yada 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 and it got the ball rolling in terms of thinking okay well you've offered one aging first baseman 140 million over seven years how much would you be willing to do for tampa native pete alonzo yeah, when yeah. he becomes a free agent after next year that's assuming that steve cohen lets him even not lets him walk out of their stadium with without a check in hand <laughs> which is there's a good chance that Steve Cohen is going to just write him a blank check and say, here, fill in the numbers and we'll make it happen. But after seeing what's happening to the Mets this year, is he going to be as you know forthcoming with that as he otherwise would be? And what's Pete thinking? What does he really want? If he looks at the Rays at that point and says, I really like what they've built. I like where they're going. They're going to have a new stadium. I want to be a part of that. Could he be enticed to jump ship and join the Rays? And at that point, the Rays could even do it and still be at under $100 million, which is ridiculous to think. But they're in that kind of high leverage position where they can still sign Pete with a really hefty contract and have plenty of space to do other things. They're not stuck with what they have. Unlike the the Mets, well, I shouldn't say unlike the Mets because they're a lot of their guys are on short term contracts, but they don't have the system to support them. So if Pete signs in New York, he knows that Steve Cohen is going to bring in a lot of talent, but through free agency, but it hasn't worked out really well, right? And they don't have the system to support that long term with guys who can fill the gaps. So does he put faith in that and in being able to get a championship there? Or does he come to Tampa and say, they've got a young nucleus, an affordable one, a brilliant front office that is going to support them all the way through, new income coming in. So basically, they're heading towards where the Padres are right now, where they have a handful of mega stars that are just supposed to be carrying the team forward. Now, this year hasn't gone their way either. (laughs) <laughs> but you would hope with homegrown guys, it would be a little bit different. Well, with the money that Steve Cohen's paid for those that Mets team, I think everybody expected more from them. And by the way, we didn't give them a gift with the wins, but I did hear one of the announcers say today that it wasn't back all the way until like April 16th since the Mets had won two back-to-back games. So mm-hmm. we we gave them that little privilege this week. But yeah, uh, Alonso, he is deeply tied to this area. And I know you've, I've talked about this before. I work sometimes down there at the Tampa Baseball Museum. And there's been some conversations with him back and forth about possibly doing some things. I know back during spring training, he was in town and he was doing something for Plant High School, his alma mater. He was doing some things down there for the baseball team. He's very involved in this community. And even when you watch the Rays on Bally Sports here, uh, the, one of the commercials that pop up is for a fishing company, or should say, I guess, a fishing equipment. It's out there in the water, somebody with a boat. Oh, my gosh, it's Pete Alonso. So, mm. you know, he he loves to fish, too. That's He's tied in with that. There's a lot of things that uh, – can make it attractive for him, I would think. And a history with this community as well. I don't know, man. I would, I'd like to see that. Yeah, I'd be fully on board with it. It would open up a lot of different avenues. Even if the Rays wanted to make a crazy offer to get him from the Mets, assuming their season continues to kind of flounder a little bit and maybe they lose faith in their direction of their team and they want to get a little bit younger. You know, if you're offering Curtis Mead plus one or two other pieces that are very intriguing to the Mets, would they bite at that point? And then for the Rays, it would be 
with the understanding that you can negotiate an extension with Pete Alonso, I would imagine if they did something like that, right? At that point, then it makes sense. It's sort of like the Roy Halladay trade with with the the Blue Jays, right? They were they they gave the Phillies a, an opening, basically. I don't know if it was forty eight hours or something like that, where they said, okay, you can negotiate a contract with Roy. If you get it done, you get the extension in, then we make the trade. And it, it's a way that you can do it so that both sides get out of it what they want. Because if you're giving up 18 years of talent, you definitely want to make sure you're getting your fair share of, of Pete Alonso at that point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but he's been fun to watch. This has been, even though we didn't win all these series, it has been fun to watch this week. I mean, watching Verlander take them out. You know, he wasn't the Verlander of old, but it was interesting to see a man like him do what he could do. And then to see Koda Singa, 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 I'm not sure, but he was just absolutely amazing. What he had 12 strikeouts in five innings. I think he pitched for a total of six, but I think he got 12 of them in the first five. So just amazing to see that kind of talent perform and his little fork ghost ball or whatever that is. It's a, so they've, they've got, it was great to be able to see some real talent out there. I'm sure that Steve Cohen like to see him perform a little better. And I'm sure Buck Showalter is getting his chewed a few times each week. So hopefully wish him well, just wish we'd won that series. Yeah. I think if, if I were the Mets right now, I would tweak it the same way that the Braves did when they lost to Cunha, which is to get a couple of power veteran gritty corner outfielders. I feel like that's what they're missing is that Dan Vogelbach has no place on that team whatsoever i'm sorry just drop that like a bad habit go get a very solid outfielder with power that can actually supplement that you can't leave it all on nemo and i'm sorry but francisco lindor is not the power hitter that you want him to be in that two hole so move pete alonso up to that two hole and then get somebody behind him that can support him you know so if they did that, I think they'll be fine and their lineup would take off. And it's a very talented team. They have the pitching, assuming Scherzer can find himself again, um, that can actually scare a lot of teams in the playoffs because those guys are not going to lay down for anyone. Um, I, I like Senga. Senga has uh, a bag of tricks <laughs> that definitely can baffle some teams and the Rays seem to be aggressive with them. Uh, maybe they should have let him try to hit the zone more often instead of swinging early but i don't know the the mets could be like the phillies of last year where they started slow and they took off after a while i feel well it's going to be interesting watching them because like i said they're they were they're in my mind they're grossly underperforming from the expectation Mm -hmm. and in my mind also that's probably true of the phillies and a few others across all of baseball but just because I like to dig at the Yankees, as you well know this. Let's go back to them for just a moment. Not even going to talk about the series with the Rays. Let's talk about what they're doing right now in Toronto, man. Oh, gosh, the back and forth between Aaron Boone and and the manager. Great series. Great series. I'm sorry, but I love ALE series because I find them so fascinating. I watch all, all the time. I'll even watch Baltimore and Red Sox games. Because I want to know what the things that you'll see highlights of later on. And you'll be like, oh, what happened during that game? Why why are the benches clearing? What happened? <laughs> yeah, well, there's there's always something. And as you said, I think sometimes Mr. Boone, Aaron Boone, inspires a lot of that. You know, I had uh, who's it, Lady Lindsay from Close Call Sports. And I've had her on the past. I noticed lately on her YouTube channel where she's explaining certain calls. She's had the Yankees up there a lot lately with everything going on. And part of my little jab at the Yankees this week is, is a couple of days old. And that's from good old Domingo Herman. Oh my gosh. Come on, man. Really? <laughs> well, and it comes, it goes deeper than that. Jer- Jared Cole's been said to have like some of the tackiest tack that there ever was in the past. And I think, you know, do you remember the shot of Yadier Molina and the ball stuck to his guard? Like, everybody's used it at some point. So, yes, now we're in a new era and people have to adjust. And when you're like Herman and you decide to ignore that, um, I think it's just to your detriment. But MLB is going to have to come up with something because the guys are going to keep trying to push the boundaries. You can't have a CSI team on the sidelines. So the umpires are completely ill-equipped 
to make that fine line is this and this is that right they're like well it was super tacky so you're up and that's it like what what is that like how i don't know it's so arbitrary it, it seems like a it's like calling traveling in the nba right you guys take five or six steps sometimes and there's no traveling and then all of a sudden one guy in a key moment oh a half a step too much so i don't know yeah it's a bit of a joke we talk about traveling in, in the nba i was like First time I'd watched college basketball for so many years, and I started watching the NBA. I said, "What the hell? What is this going on here?" But you know, it's, mm-hmm. it doesn't make sense to me. But Domingo Herman, if you all didn't know, I think everybody pretty much well does by now. Yankees pitcher, he was accused of having some sticky stuff on his hand. But here's the part that gets me, Matt, is about a month ago, I think they were the Yankees were playing the Twins, and this umpire crew. They told him, they checked his hands. They said, you're sticky. You need to wash your hands. He washed his hands. He came back and I think they were still sticky. But it, anyway, um, he knew, he knew better from that. They're, they're looking for you. Now, what happened is earlier this week, the same umpire crew that watched him play the <laughs> twins were the same ones who judged his stickiness this week. And I saw a quote from one of the umpires, something to the effect about it's the stickiest hand I've ever touched. <laughs> that sounds a little strange in itself. Maybe yeah, a little too, a little too, a little too personal. <laughs> but, <laughs> oh gosh, I don't know, man. It's baseball is entertaining a lot of different ways. Sometimes but, not the way we expect. I think we give we give professional ball players a little bit too much credit. Sometimes we're like, well, they can't be that dumb. Well. Yes, they Manny Ramirez was caught how many times doing PEDs? Well, what about uh A Rod? Same thing. Like you're talking about the elites, you know, jeopardizing everything. Why? Well, you're talking about 250 million dollars. I jeopardized quite a bit for 250 million dollars. <laughs> so, you know, Domingo Herman's trying to keep his job with the Yankees yeah. of all places, and he's trying to push those limits to try to make sure he's effective. The question I have is, without the sticky stuff, would he have dominated the race the way he did? <laughs> I don't think so. Probably yeah. not. Probably not. Because, But, you know, and it was great to watch him, but whether he had the sticky stuff or not, and I believe it, would, it wouldn't hurt for players to have some rosin on their, their hands, but to be able to say what that level should be, it's, it would be difficult to have some kind of continuity across all the baseball. So we'll put that on the back burner here. Mm-hmm. Hey, coming up, man, the boys are coming home. They've been on the road now. Let's see. We were out there with the Yankees. We were out there with the Mets. We were out there with the Orioles. We're finally coming back tomorrow being Friday and back at the trap. The Rays will be playing at three games, three games with the Brewers. And then they'll be facing the Jays uh, four games here at home. And then the, the Dodgers. So they got a, a nice little stretch coming up ahead of home games. This is the toughest stretch of the season by far. Like you're, you're talking about the Dodgers coming in. And even beyond that, you've got the Texas Rangers, the Astros, like it doesn't get any easier for the Rays until July, I think, or mid June. I think they end up with the series against the A's. And then at the end of June, they have one against the Royals, but when you get into July, the Rays are going to have seven days off in July. Seven. And then they have six days off in August. So you're talking about Jeez. two months where the Rays are going to have plenty of time for guys to heal, to guys, for guys, especially the starters, that they want to limit some of the innings, change things around a little bit. That's where they're going to have the opportunity to do it. Um, so I think if they can survive and get through this stretch being just slightly over 500 between now and mid June, then they're in extremely good place, but they do have to watch the way that they're building the pen and leaning on it because (laughs) I, I keep saying it, but if they don't resolve their issues quickly enough with the pen, it can become a thing that brings them back to the pack. And then if they're back with the pack, what does that do for the mental state of the team as a whole? We had a historic start and now look at us. Like we're even with X, Y, Z, right? Yeah. And so I think they they have to stay at the top. And if they don't, then there's going to be some 
pressure. We all know how Brendan Lau does with pressure. I like the fact that he's bringing the back around. He seems more relaxed. He's actually back to being a little bit more himself this last week. But the more that they put pressure on themselves, and then it seems to... like, like These two series is a good example. So when they started out with, against the Yankees, it seemed like they had momentum, right? And then the more that series went, the less momentum they seemed to have. They eked out one win at the end, but you still didn't feel like the Rays had really good momentum, especially whenever they didn't have a ginormous lead going into the eighth inning, right? And so I think it's important for them to keep momentum is all I'm saying. Well, I think that's critical for the success of any team and they definitely need it. I mean, the, the enthusiasm that they have out there, but then they see um, <laughs> your team give up two runs in the, the eighth and two in the ninth, and suddenly it's like that just can completely deflate a team because you were winning and you just lost that game because pitching pitching wasn't what it should be. And You can't blame it all on the pitcher, but those kind of things can deflate a team. I posted something on Twitter the other day. It was of Kevin Cash and Randy in the dugout. And Kevin's looking over at Randy. They're both leaning up against the bar out at the field. And Randy's got that look of kind of a stern look. And Kevin looks over to, to Randy and takes his hands and just makes tries to make a little smile like, hey, smile, you know, without saying it. Just puts his lips up there like that. And uh, Randy looks at him and shakes his head. No. It's like hmm? that that said so much. I said, Dag on, Randy. If you're feeling like that, bro, we we got some problems. Yeah, he's not feeling his mojo to last a little bit. I feel like he's definitely taking a little bit of a step back. Not having Andy definitely hurt in the yeah. in the Met series. And I felt the more the Met series went, the more the bats were tightening up and they were pressing. In the last game, especially like today, they were pressing. You felt like the bats, the, the bats were quicker. They were not as patient at the plate. And especially against a, a pitcher like McGill, I don't know if they just figured that they would be able to dominate him at some point, but they just didn't have those steady, good eye at the plate at bats that they've become really good at this year. So maybe they just wanted to get home, some home cooking and uh, – <laughs> Get some good, you know, grub in you and a little bit of sleep in your own mattress and see how it goes in the next series. The feel-good series against Willie Adamas and all the X-Rays. Mike Brosso is coming back. I don't think Chapman's pitching for the Rays yet, but that would have been interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, it's it's going to be a fun series. Ozzy Timmons is still there, so yeah. uh, we're going to get to see some push-ups on the opposing dugouts and – I think the series will be fun, and then they'll take on the Jays, which that, to me, is a series I would love to see them go three and one in. Oh, yeah. I want them to take three or four. If they can get four, that's great. But I'll take three out of four just because I feel like the Jays need it. The Jays need to be told that the Rays are better. And if the Rays don't do that, that's going to bring a big question up because the the Jays made them look – we're the first team this year – to make them look human, yeah. right? So they've got to set the tone this time and say, no, 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 we're the big dog and, and you have to take a seat back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm ready for that, but I'm, I'm actually going to go up to one of the other ALS teams. I'm going to head up to Boston here in a few weeks and watch the race play up there. So that should be kind of interesting too. Any recommendations? I just love Fenway. I That's one of the first places that I can honestly say I saw a baseball game. And to me, it has that whole, uh, you know, the best feel of it. They have great snacks. You're right over the top of the field. You can hear everybody. Everybody's ooing and aahing. They're all part of the game. They're all very knowledgeable of the game. You may not always agree with their point of view, but <laughs> they'll let you say yours and they'll say theirs. And that's all. That's part of the game. So I love going to Fenway. There's lots to do there. There's lots of great action around the stadium as well. So I think if you if you like to play pool and all that kind of stuff, there's a nice bar right by outside the outfield wall in the right field. That's uh that's solid. So I would recommend that and uh, just you know get out in the town. I love Boston. Go to Quincy Market and buy the wife a few things. There you go. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, man. I appreciate it, brother. Talking again today with Matt Germain, and you can find him on Twitter at Matt M A T underscore Germain underscore Jermaine is G-E-R-M-A-I-N underscore M-A-T underscore Jermaine G-E-R-M-A-I-N at 
underscore. That's where you can find him. Oh, gosh. All right, brother. Is there anything else we should be looking at or addressing today? Um, I think the thing to look for now is who's going to be the first team to make that trade. And how does that set the tone for the other trades? Because I think now you're getting that zone of time when trades start, maybe the first week of June, but you're going to start to hear the chatter a lot more because some teams will fall back. They'll be comfortable making one or two key deals. The first team that sets the tone there puts pressure on all the other ones. Last year, it was the Braves, right? They were very aggressive early on. And I think the people didn't see them as being aggressive and impactful at the time, but they turned out to be that like that, right? Oh, so yeah. I think the key is that essentially is who's plugging up their holes and shoring up the, the ship for, for that strong storm, right? I want to see who that is because that GM is going to be putting himself out there and what do other teams around them do at that point? Excitement will out, my friend. I want to thank you all again for joining us here today on Baseball Biz on Deck. And Matt, thanks again for coming on, brother. You always give insight to all of us Rays fan with another Rays Up edition of baseball biz. So I appreciate all you've done and keep going at it, my friend. Thank you very much for having me on. I always appreciate it. Okay, brother. We take care and thanks again. Special thanks to Matt Germain for joining us here today. Just remember, you can find Matt on Twitter at Matt, M-A-T underscore Germain, G-E-R-M-A-I-N underscore. You can find me, Mark, at the baseball biz on Twitter and you can also find me at baseball biz, www.baseballbizondeck.com and anywhere you like on the directories, whether it be Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, etc. So until next time, thanks again, and we look forward to talking with you again real soon. Special thanks to XAKRUX for the music rocking forward.